I chance slightly because you see that uh, I, talk, I will talk about optimization of HTC treatment today, but of course a little bit of tomorrow. So when we speak about optimizing HTC management, uh, we mean that we will do whatever is possible to improve the outcome of our patients. But the ways to achieve this goal will of course depend upon the uh, tumor burden of the patient. And clearly, it will differ if you are in a curative setting or in a palliative setting. In curative setting for patients with early HEC, BCLC0 or A, you will try to uh, uh, increase the rate of patients that will be eligible for ablation or resection in order to uh, implement uh, a curative uh, procedure in a safe, without compromising safety of patients, and you will try to highlight patients with a high risk of recurrence, which will change the way you manage patients according to a transplant strategy. You can also decide to decrease the rate of recurrence by considering adjuvant therapy, and we'll talk about this exciting uh, field right now. And in the palliative setting, you will be uh, more about uh, precision medicine, deciding whether a given patient will have a given mutation that will respond to a given treatment, or if the patient presents some specific signature that will be associated with a better response. So first, if we uh, see what we can do for optim optimization of uh, treatment in the curative setting, you can see here on this cartoon that you can uh, consider factors related to the tumor or the patient itself or the uh, liver. In orange, I highlighted the factors that you cannot uh, uh, act upon, but you can only consider to refine the prognosis, such as a tumor characteristic, the underlying liver disease and characteristic of the patient, and I will uh, develop some more about biology. Regarding the action you can take, here highlighted in blue, such as the quality of resection or ablation, adjuvant trials and liver disease management. I will not develop this because you are well aware as a pathologist uh, of how it is important to uh, cure the cause of the liver disease and prevent uh, varicell bleeding, etc. But I will more develop uh, how you can impact here and here with these uh, new technologies. So first, how you can improve and optimize the treatment of patient in the curative setting using information obtained by liver biopsy. As you know, our community has been uh, really reluctant to perform biopsy for many years because we thought it was dangerous, not informative, but of course, and hopefully, we uh, kept uh, doing it for uh, scientific purposes, and this is how we highlighted some very simple pathological patterns such as differentiation or uh, other uh, pathological markers that are able to refine the prognosis. And in the meantime, we worked on uh, highlighting how molecular profiling of the tumor can help to refine the prognosis, whether obtained on liver biopsies or a resection specimen. But as you know, these signatures are not ready for uh, use in clinical yet because they have to be confirmed in uh, prospective uh, studies and tested in randomized control studies. However, right now, what you can do is to uh, use pathological results that are fairly correlated with this uh, molecular classifications here, for example, I highlighted here between G1 and G6, the six most uh, famous transcriptomic uh, signatures for HEC. And you see, for example, here that pathologists are used to describe the macrotrabecular pattern of liver cancer, which is a thickening of the trabecula, which corresponds to a given here genotype uh, G3 um, transcriptomic signatures uh, in patients with FGF19 driven hepatocellular carcinoma. And we know, based on the so simple uh, determination of this uh, pattern, that patients that present with this macrotrabecular subtype have a worse prognosis in terms of overall survival and recurrence following resection or ablation. So you see how the information of a single biopsy can be used in this curative setting. Now, continuing with our agenda, how can we improve the prognosis of patients using the more uh, sophisticated uh, surgical and ablation procedures? In your everyday practice, every week, you discuss with your colleague in multidisciplinary board which patient can be eligible for resection or ablation. And of course, this will depend upon the size and the localization of the tumor. But for example, for surgery, you will aim at uh, highlighting patient with the uh, most favorable safety profile, 
with uh, excellent liver function and no portal hypertension. And you will use for this various scoring systems such as Child Childpug, Mel score, or Albi score. And you can also use some very dedicated uh, procedures such as laparoscopic surgery. But I think that the most uh, improved technologies have been uh, in the last few years uh, re uh, regarding ablation, where you see you can use heat for radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, cold with cryoablation, and now electroporation, which uh, is dedicated to provoking uh, poration of the tumors and uh, inducing apoptosis. So you can basically treat any tumor in any location within the liver, even close to the vessels or the bile ducts. The main issue for ablation is now to increase the size of tumors that can be ablated without risk of recurrence. And for this, we use what we call multibipolar ablation, which is as compared to monopolar classical ablation with the heat going from the center to the periphery. The insertion of several no, uh, probes here that will deliver the heat between two probes, and thus you can ablate larger tumors and decrease the rate of local recurrence for these patients. So you can see here, for example, a five centimeter tumor in a patient, and you can, you, if you refer to the BCLC criteria, you can say that this patient should not be ablated, and for example, if this patient cannot be uh, operated on, you will decide a palliative treatment such as uh, TACE. But you can see here, by inserting seven probes ar uh, around the tumor, you can here obtain a necrosis and a complete remission of the tumor using this kind of technique. So this is another way to optimize your curative strategies. Next stop is using adjuvant uh, trials that are uh, currently ongoing in our centers, because you know we failed to demonstrate uh, any adjuvant uh, uh, strategy in HCC, we tried with sorafenib. You remember the STORM trial, which was negative, but also impacted by the fact that sorafenib was not well tolerated in these patients. But of course, the, uh, the forthcoming immunotherapy hold promises for this patient because they are much more to, uh, well tolerated. And also, we, there is a strong rationale to combine this resection or ablation, mostly ablation, with immunotherapy. Because we know that when we ablate the tumor or we resect the tumor, there is uh, an immune stimulation in the non-tumorous liver that can be further enhanced by immunotherapy, whether in neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting that can be, uh, act as a symbiosis to uh, dec decrease the rate of recurrences. So this has been uh, nicely uh, shown in preliminary studies where you see that patients who received new adjuvant uh, using trimalimumab tri before ablation had an increase in uh, recruitment of uh, T lymphocytes. And also we uh, were able to show that, to see that uh, the higher was the reaction, the higher was the probability of response. So clearly this rationale is very interesting and promising. So, uh, we are living an exciting time because now we don't have all the results of the phase three studies in the palliative setting, but already we can include our patients in this ongoing phase three trial using nivolumab, pembrolizumab, or immunotherapy association. You see several hundred uh, of patients around the globe, and clearly every week you can decide that some of your patients may, uh, uh, may be benefit from inclusion in these trials, although we are awaiting for the results. So. Uh, to conclude, after this uh, uh, creative and adjuvant setting, uh, I would talk about a little bit of precision medicine in the palliative setting because, you know, we have been uh, really uh, blessed in the last two years after 10 years of negative trials where we only had so half an him. Now in two years, we have uh, a wider range of therapeutic, uh, molecular of therapeutic approaches in this uh, palliative setting with five molecules approved. We have in first line therapy so half an him and uh, lenvatinib, which are multi-kinase inhibitors. And in second line, we have rigorafinib and cabozantinib, which are also uh, multi-kinase inhibitors. And also ramisurimab, who is, uh, which is a monoclonal antibody. So uh, now <laughs> we are kind of spoiled because we don't know how to choose between these molecules because we only have phase three trial demonstrating uh, superiority or non-inferiority between the molecules, but we don't know how to choose in first line between sorafenib and lanvatinib, and someday between those two molecules and immunotherapy. Same goes with second line therapy between regorafenib, cabozantinib, or amirciramab, and someday with immunotherapy. You can be uh, you can use some uh, criteria from the uh, clinical trials, whether inclusion criteria 
or a, a postdoc analysis, but this is not satisfactory, and we, we really need to uh, highlight some uh, biomarkers to uh, um, be uh, more uh, effective in the choice of the therapy in order to give the best chance to our patient to respond to the treatment. So if we go back to the uh, information based on the biopsy of the patients, what we can do is, of course, uh, do a tumor genomic analysis of the tumor, and there is basically two different ways. We can uh, do the predictive way to identify a specific mutation that will be targeted by a specific molecule, but this is not uh, ready yet for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. We have preclinical study uh, for anti-MET molecules or anti-FGFR molecules, but this is very, very early. But what we can do also is to use this molecular information to decide whether a given molecule with multiple uh, targets, such as sorafenib or immunotherapy, could be beneficial to a given patient. So as you know, the problem of hepatocellular carcinoma, as in many tumors, is that there are many oncogenic pathways that are activated or deactivated on the genetic uh, patterns. And you can see here the biological pathway affecting TGF, beta R, uh, JAKSTAT pathway, uh, mTOR pathway, beta catenin etc., etc. But the problem in uh, hepatocellular carcinoma as compared to other tumors is that the most frequent alteration and genetic alteration in liver cancer are not druggable. So only 20 to 25% of uh, targets can be uh, used to design specific drugs. This is why up to now, uh, we, we, it is very difficult to design trials because if you uh, try to uh, target uh, a specific uh, mutation or alteration that uh, is only present in 5 to 10 percent. You can imagine how it is difficult to design a trial around the world. But for uh, prognosis purposes with existing molecules such as sorafenib or immunotherapy, we begin to have examples from other centers that have implemented a biology, molecular biology in their uh, uh, discussion in multidisciplinary board, such as here where you see that they uh, try to identify uh, retrospectively in patients that were either treated by sorafenib or immunotherapy in first-line therapy, how we could uh, highlight some specific signatures that could be predictive or response to this therapy. You can see here, for example, in patients under sorafenib, that on this waterfall plot, that patients that had the worst uh, response or no response at all, uh, most of them had P3 key uh, uh, kinase uh, alteration here, and you can uh, see that these patients, when uh, considering their uh, caplomerular curves, did really worse in terms of progression-free survival or over, uh, over survival as compared to patients that were not mutated in this, in this uh, pathway. So you can highlight patients that will not respond to sorafenib, and this is a, a first step towards precision medicine. Same goes with immunotherapy, where uh, you see here again on this waterfall that those patients that did not respond to immunotherapy, you know that only 20 to 25 percent of patients will respond. We will see that with Bruno later. That you can see that most of these patients had mutation in uh, beta catenin, hence uh, providing a first clue to uh, highlight those patients that have no chance in uh, responding to this very expensive treatment and uh, hopefully uh, step again into a, a more precision medicine uh, decision-making process. So to summarize, uh, I think that optimizing HEC management is possible right now, but will be even more uh, feasible tomorrow by the use of information based on the biopsy in small tumors that can help to refine the prognosis of patients, and in parallel in uh, developing some more and more sophisticated ablation and surgery uh, procedure to uh, broaden the spectrum of patients that can be eligible for remission of liver cancer. Adjuvant strategies, I think, are very promising, and we are uh, right now uh, blessed with all these ongoing trials, and we will have the results in a short time, in the forthcoming years. And of course, for palliative setting, clearly, we have to uh, decide upon molecular information to decide whether this type of drug will be the good one for the given patient. So, Clearly, I think that one of the most uh, important messages here is that we have to keep on uh, processing uh, sequential biobanking bio in academic and um, industrial trials to uh, get into these goals. Thank you for your attention.